Hello again and welcome back to another episode of Adding Game Sounds where today we're going to be looking at 3D audio and more specifically how we can move our 3D sounds so that they kind of follow the player for large objects that need big sounds. Before we start I just want to let you guys know that this is your last chance to join in on the FMOD and Unity Essentials course. It's going to be closed from 11.59pm Eastern Standard Time on the 7th of February 2020. So if you're looking for an online course that can really help improve your audio skills and give you a good clear understanding of how to use FMOD and its API inside of Unity, you know, without getting things too complicated, explaining things in nice and simple terms, even if you're completely unfamiliar with C-sharp code, this might be the best course for you. So if you have any questions, you can email me or add a comment to this video or just go straight to the website, which I'll have linked in the description or in a card in the top right corner of this video. Okay, with that out of the way, let's jump into today's episode. And before we start messing around with Unity and FMOD, I kind of want to explain exactly what we're doing today. So here you have a very simple diagram of a player in a level, right? There's not much going on and they can't hear anything. Uh, but imagine the player's walking along and they stumble across a speaker. That speaker's playing audio, and it's playing audio in three dimensions. So the player can hear the audio from their left ear or their right ear if they turn so that the sound is coming from their left or from the right, so there's panning information there. But also the further away the player is from the speaker, the less they're going to hear, and the closer they are, the louder they're going to hear it at. So if you imagine this circle, you can see this green circle as the kind of sphere, the kind of maximum distance that the player can be from the speaker before they can't hear it anymore. So if the player is standing about here, they're not going to be able to hear the speaker. But if they move inside this circle, they are going to hear the speaker. For the most part, to create this effect, we've just been attaching audio to our objects in our scene. And they've worked because the objects themselves are nice and small. So having this simple sphere controlling the distance attenuation and the panning Worked pretty well. Cool. So let's say the player keeps going and uh, they eventually stumble upon a pool of deadly acid. Now, as the audio implementers, we have taken, let's say we take the same approach as we did with the speaker. So we took our audio and we just said we want to attach its position to the object we want it to represent. So let's say we had the sound of acid bubbling, then let's just attach it to the center of the acid object. Problem with this is, the because the object is so wide, the sphere, the kind of max distance that the player will hear the sound at, isn't big enough. So what happens is the player walks along, they don't hear the acid, they're also blind, did I mention that? They're blind, so they fall into the acid and die. Uh-oh, we screwed up. Uh, so this is kind of a problem we can have sometimes when it comes to really big objects that need 3D audio. So what do we do? How do we fix this issue? Well, what we're going to do with a clever bit of coding, which I'm going to show you in a bit, is we're actually going to tell our sound source to move as close as it can to the player without leaving the area of the object it's trying to represent. So by doing this, it doesn't matter where the player is, you know, say they're here, say they're here or here, the sound source is going to follow them. Uh, and so long as they're sort of in within the range of the acids that it kind of takes up in the game world, they'll be able to hear the sound, not only at a good volume, but as if they're on top of the sound itself. So they're not going to hear it from the left or the right, they'll hear it from the center. It's only when they leave this kind of range here that the acid takes up. That was awful, let me do that again. This range here, from here to here, is only when they go either beyond those points that the sound will start to play from the left or the right ear, giving them panning information and direction. So that's exactly what we're going to do with our acid pools that we have scattered throughout our 2D game kit. Uh, and the very first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually demonstrate this to you. Normally I don't, normally I like to just get stuck in and show you how to do this, but I really want you guys to understand what we're doing here and how it works. So let's quickly have a listen to it in the game. Okay, so here we have our acid, and you should notice right off the bat we've got a little gray dot that's appeared that wasn't there before. That gray dot is going to represent the position at which we're playing our audio from. So if I go back to my diagram here, imagine that gray dot as this little green dot here. What's gonna happen is that's gonna move depending on the position of our player uh, once it comes within range of the uh, acid pull within the uh, X axis. So if I move the player closer to the acid, if you're wearing headphones, you should be able to hear it coming from your left ear. Now let's see what happens if I jump above the acid. 
So now it should sound centered, which is what we want because it, you know, in the game world, we're kind of above or almost on top of the acid. And you should also notice that the gray dot that represents our, the position we're playing our audio from has moved in relation to the player. So let's keep going. Again, so even though we've moved quite a bit, it still sounds centered. Now, if we move away from the acid, you can see that the audio isn't moving any further, and we can now hear it from our right ear. Cool, so that's what we're after today. First things first, let's dive into our FMOD project, and let's take a look at the event I've set up to create this effect. So inside my sound effects environment uh, folders, I've created a event, a 3D event called Acid. Now you don't have to do this, but I've used two audio files. I've used my Acid Pool loop, which sounds like this. And I'm using the Shoreline loop that sounds like this. So we're getting a combination of acid bubbling and sort of water rippling, almost like there's a tide. Now both of these files I've made asynchronous and I've set them to loop. The reason why is because they were at different lengths. So by making them asynchronous, I can stretch them or kind of resize them so that the regions themselves are the same length, but you know, we won't be hearing one after the other or one without the other. If the if we if the acid pool finishes before the shoreline audio finishes, the acid pool will simply loop back on itself. Uh, so make sure you've got them both marked. I've also, which is very handy, is I've given this, I've given both audio files or both regions uh, an offset by 50%. And then what I've done is I've randomized it by about, again, 50%. And you can do that by right clicking the start offset, going add modulation and clicking random and this little knob will appear. And what's, what that's gonna do is every time this uh, audio is played or this event is played, it's going to give the cursor for each uh, audio file a different position. So if I quickly play it, you can see one started here and the other started here. And the idea is not only does that mean that these audio files are going to sound different between each other each time, but for all other instances of the acid, they're going to sound different as well. I've also adjusted the level slightly. So for the shoreline audio itself, I've brought it down by minus uh, 7.5 dB, and then both tracks I've lowered by minus 9. All of this so far, by the way, is pretty optional in terms of the effect we're going to be creating in C-sharp, but I thought I'd share it anyway. Uh, for the acid pool loop, I've added a little bit of EQ, just taking some of the high end off, because it was a bit too hissy, and added a bit of reverb so it sounded like it was coming from a cave, I suppose. Uh, then for audio track 2, I've taken uh, a little bit of the low end out, because it was a bit too noisy, a bit too sounding. Almost sounding like there was a lot of wind around it, so we got rid of that. Then on the master track, I've added a low pass filter, which we're going to talk about in a bit. And for the spatializer, I've turned off distance attenuation. And the reason why is because I didn't feel that this gave me enough control over distance attenuation, basically. So instead, I've decided to use the distance parameter that FMOD provides you with, which we'll talk about in a bit. For enveloping what I've done though, however, is I've increased the sound size of the audio to seven. Now what sound size does is it basically sets a distance that the player has to be away from the sound source before we start to hear any panning information. And we can demonstrate this with the 3D preview at the top here. Let's just quickly make it a bit bigger. So let's say that this arrow here and the gray circle around it is the sound. And the center of this graph, I guess that's what it is, it's like a sphere, is the player. So the player's in the center and I'm moving the sound position with my mouse here. So if the player is within this gray circle, they're just gonna hear the sound as if they're in the middle of the sound, right? So in our case, in the middle of this acid bubbling. But if the sound and the player are far enough away from each other that the player is no longer within that gray circle, then they're gonna start to hear panning information. It's gonna sound like it's coming either from their left or from their right. And if I adjust the sound size, you can see it changes the size of that gray circle. Then what the min extent does is it says, okay, once the player has exceeded that range of the sound size, how kind of big do we want the direction, the position of the sound to sound like, if that makes sense? So if we set min extent to about zero degrees, the position of the sound is gonna be very clear and specific. You're gonna almost hear it from a specific point in the world. However, if we increase it, it's gonna sound a lot wider, like the sound itself, the sound source is a lot larger sound. So it's almost like the difference between hearing someone drop a glass bottle on the ground and hearing that cracking, 
to your right or someone exploding a grenade. Ignoring the fact that they're going to sound, you know, different in terms of volume, the glass cracking you're going to hear at a specific position, whereas the grenade is going to cover more of an area and it's going to be a bit harder to work out where exactly the, the grenade itself blew up. So both of these I adjusted to 7 and 70 degrees because, like I said, this is we're working with this big acid pool. Uh, so we want the sound to kind of sound a bit large and take up a large area. So that's why I've adjusted those two settings. Okay, so going back to the reason why I've removed distance attenuation or turned it off on the spatializer is because I wanted more control over it and I wanted to do it myself using the distance parameter. Now the distance parameter is a parameter that FBOD comes with and will automatically calculate the distance between wherever we play our sound from and wherever, wherever our studio listener component is in our world. And if you remember back to the last episode, we set that at this time in the level anyway, to wherever the player object itself is, okay? So the distance parameter is gonna measure the distance between the pool, or rather where we play our sound from, and the player automatically for us. And the way you bring up the parameter is by selecting a new parameter, go new parameter, and then under parameter type, you select distance. Now, as you can see, the first thing I did is I've automated the volume. So I've said that when the distance between the player and the sound of our acid is uh, any larger than nine, then I want to start to drop this, the volume of our event off. Then once it gets to 20, I want to make sure there's no audio playing. So any further than 20, the player can't hear the acid. Then what I've also done is I've added this low pass filter, which I've also automated, as you can see here. So what this is gonna do is, based on the distance between the player and the sound, is it's gonna remove some of those higher frequencies. So when the player is right on top of the sound at, well, when the distance is nothing, basically, you're gonna hear the acid sound at its fullest, all the range of frequencies. Uh, but then if they start to move away from the sound, you're gonna hear less and less of those high frequencies. And I suppose this is a bit of, just a bit of an aesthetic choice. I felt it sounded a bit better if we couldn't hear all the bubbling and the fizzing if we had a bit of distance between us and the acid. So to set automation, I'm sure you know by now, you just click on the fader or the effects, you right click it and you, whilst I can't because I've already done it, you click a button that says add automation when you've selected the parameter sheet you want to control that automation with. Now we've also got one more parameter called acid above, but I'm gonna come back to that later because it's a bit of an optional thing, you don't have to add it for this effect. Okay, so we've got our sound, brilliant. So now we want to not only select a point at which we want to play a tap, but we need to tell it to play and stop, etc. So what I did is I found uh, the prefab of uh, the acid that's scattered around through this game, which is this here, it's just called acid. To find it, go to your project tab, just type acid, and it's just a box here, a little blue box, and you can tell it is a prefab, because down here it tells you the type of file it is, acid prefab. So I'm gonna open that up. So by adding a script and also our audio to this prefab, our audio is gonna be copied to all instances of the acid throughout our game, so we don't have to do it multiple times. Okay, so what I did is I came over to the inspector, I clicked add component, and I basically created a new C-sharp script to add to this prefab. So you might not be able to see it because I'm aware I've blocked it with my head, but uh, if you scroll down to the bottom of this uh, add component page, there'll be an option called new script. You click on that, give your script a name, and then that'll be attached to the prefab and all other copies of it loaded into the game. So I called mine Acid Audio Following Player because I couldn't think of a better name. Uh, so let's right click it, click edit script, and let's look at how we can set this call effect up. Now, if you're interested in using this script, don't worry, you can copy it from my website, scottgamesounds.com, which I'll have linked in the description and in the top right corner for you. So the first thing I did was I created uh, quite a few variables, so let's talk about them. The first two are reference variables. One is of the water area type, called water area, and the other is of the transform type, called player. Now the first one is basically, if I go back to Unity, the first one is basically going to reference this script here, Water Area, which is also attached to all of the acid pools within our game. Now Water Area is a script created by the 2D Game Kit makers, and it's what they use to determine the size and the scale of the actual acid itself. So you can see if I start adjusting the X size here, you can see it increase on your screen. Now if we open that script up, right click and click edit, you can see that everything, or most of the things written within this script uh, is obviously within the main class itself, water area, the name of the script. But you can see they've created a namespace which they've stored the class itself within. So that means if we're to access any of the information within this script, and therefore any of the information we see here in the Unity Inspector, 
we need to be using that namespace. So going back to our script, what I've done at the top is I've just said using game kit 2D. So that will allow us to access information from within the water area script. Now the transform variable called player is basically gonna do something similar. Instead of getting a component from within the same game object, it's going to find the location of our player, Ellen, and it's gonna access the transform component of her. Basically, it's gonna find where she is in the world. Then we've got four float variables, so four variables that are gonna hold a number. One called x position max, x position min, y position max, and y position min. So let's quickly go back to our prefab to explain that. What these are basically going to do is they're going to find the range at which we can play our audio from. So once we've calculated both the size and the scale of our acid pool and where it's located in our game world, we're going to use these variables to hold coordinates essentially. Y position max, for example, is gonna find where on the Y axis of our game world that the top of this acid pool is sitting. So let's say on the Y axis, this one was at Y1. Then Y position min would do the opposite. It would find where on the Y axis the bottom of it sits. So let's say this was minus one. From that, we then know that we want the sound of our audio to play from anywhere between Y1 and Y minus one. Then we do the same for the X axis. We find where on the X axis that the left side of the acid is. And then we also find on the X axis where the right is. So the right would be the maximum and the left would be the minimum. So let's say that the maximum is five and the minimum is minus five. So let's say the player was on a platform above our acid pool. And let's say their coordinates was X x0, y4, for example. Well, x0 is in between our range of five and minus five. So therefore, our little dot that represented our audio would be in the middle. However, because four exceeds the limit of our y range, remember was between one and minus one, the highest our the highest position our audio can go is to Y1. So we'd expect our audio to be playing from this position here, which would be X0, Y1. Once we've then calculated that point, we can store it within our audio point variable, which is of the vector free data type. That takes information for free axis, so X, Y, and Z, but we'll talk about the Z in a little bit. We can then tell our audio to play at whatever position audio point is at in our game world. Then the last variable we've got is called acid loop, and this is an fmod.studio.event instance variable. So this we know is gonna hold a reference to our event in fmod, which we can tell to play and stop and do whatever with. Okay, so now we've got all of our variables and we know how they work. We're gonna move on to the start function, which we know will run on the first frame of our game or first frame of each scene rather. So we're gonna use this to kind of set up some information and do some calculations basically. First things first, we need to point these two reference variables to the specific coordinates they're gonna hold a reference to. So in the case of the water area script, we know we want to point it towards our water area component attached to our acid. So the way we do that is we write the name of our variable water area and we say equals get component and then we write the type we're looking for, water area, which obviously has to match the type of the variable. By doing that, it's gonna look through all of the components attached to this object and it's gonna find water area. Then we do the same for the player variable, but this time because we're looking for a component attached to a different object, instead we're gonna use find object of type player character. Now the player character is a script. If I could go back into Unity and look for Ellen, player character is a script that is only ever going to be attached to the player character, the Ellen game object. So we know by searching for this, it's safe to assume that we're going to find the object that the player is controlling. And therefore, once we found that object, we'll be able to access the transform component. So as you can see, I followed up the find object of type function with dot transform. So now a reference to the transform component attached to Ellen is stored within player. So the first thing we wanna do is find the maximum height and the maximum length of our acid pool, whichever acid pool we're interacting with. So what we do is cr we create two new float variables called water length and water height. For water length, we wanna access the water area script that we just found, and we wanna access this number here, the size of the uh, acid pool in the x-axis. So in this example, we find that the size of the pool in the x-axis is 6.88. For water height, we wanna do the same thing, but because we're after the height this time, we wanna look at the difference in the y-axis. So if we go back to Unity, 
we can see that the value of the size of the acid pool in the y-axis is two. Now these numbers here are for the prefab itself. Once copied into the game, the prefab has been adjusted slightly. So for example, in the case of this first acid pool here, you can see the numbers are different. Well, in the case of this acid pool, those are the numbers that would be loaded into these variables for us to work with. So now it's time to calculate what I was explaining earlier. We want to find where in our game world that the sides of this acid pool are located. So let's start by calculating the X position, specifically the maximum that it can be at. First thing we need to do is we need to find the center of the object. Once we've done that, we can find the center of it on the X axis. So we write transform to access its transform component, dot position to access its positional coordinates, and then dot X to access it on the X axis specifically, which is what I've done here. So in the case of this acid pool here, we know that the center position of it on the X axis is minus 28.5. Once we've found its position in the game world where it's centered on the X axis, we want to take its, the length of it, the maximum length, we want to divide that in two, and we will then want to add that to the X, to that value we found, because that's gonna give us the maximum position it's at on the X axis. Basically where this line here, this side is, in our game world. So to find its size, the first thing we do is times the length of it, which we calculated earlier, we wanna times that by its scale on the x-axis. Now, every object in Unity has a scale, and by adjusting the size of the scale, we can adjust its size in a specific axis. Now, it's not enough for us to just use this value here to work out its maximum size, because if the scale is anything other than one, that's gonna also affect its maximum size. For example, if I start to lower the scale, you can see that it gets lower in the game world. However, the value of size X underwater area has remained the same. So by timesing these values together, we're gonna find out a the combination of the two and therefore where it truly sits in the game world in relation to whichever axis we're looking at, the X or the Y. So to access the scale of an object, we write transform, which is again, the component the scale sits on, and then we write lossy scale. Lossy scale is gonna find the scale of it in relation to the entire game world, a global scale. Then we follow that up with the specific axis we're interested in, which is the X axis. Then once we've calculated the length by timesing them together, we simply divide it by two. And because we're working, because we're storing this number inside a float variable, we write two with an F next to it. Then once we've got a value from all of that, we add it to wherever the object is on the X axis in the world. So now we know where this line here sits on the X axis, but now we need to know where this line sits. To work that out, we just do the same thing we've done, but instead of adding the two values we got, we're gonna minus them. So again, we're gonna find the size of it or the length. We're gonna divide it by two, and this time we're gonna minus it from the center to find out where this line sits. Then we do the exact same thing for the Y axis, but this time we wanna be interacting with the height instead of the length. So again, we find out what the height is, and we also find out where on the Y axis this the center of this object sits, which is at minus 0.47. Then we times its size underwater area, which is 1.8, by its scale, which again is one, and we divide the answer of that by two. Then depending on whether or not we want to calculate the top or the bottom line, we either add that or lower or minus that from its position on the Y axis. And then we store those two numbers in Y position max and Y position min. Then the last thing we wanna do in the start function is simply tell our audio to play. So we've done this loads of times already. We're gonna say acid loop equals the instance of the event we've created. So enter the event path, which for me was sound effects environment acid into the uh, create instance function and then set that to acid loop. Then tell the acid loop or tell your event to start and also tell it to release. Release is gonna destroy the instance once the event has told to stop. And we're gonna tell the event to stop later in this script. Next, we move on to the update function, which is now gonna run every frame that the game is running for. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna calculate where we're gonna actually play that audio from. At the moment, it's just playing from the center of the object, which isn't what we want. So what we're gonna do is create two new numbers, one called X position and one called Y position. And then we're gonna feed that into the audio point variable I told you about earlier, which remember, is gonna represent where in our game world that we want to play our audio from. To do that, we're going to use a very clever function called mathf.clamp. What clamp does is it takes a value and it will give us that value back so long as it sits between a range that we give it. So let's say that we set a range between zero and 10 and we were monitoring a variable. Well, let's say that that variable was set to five. 
Well, by putting it into clamp and then clamp producing it back out to us, it would still give us five. However, let's say that that number we're monitoring is now 20. Well, 20 doesn't sit in between zero and 10. So what it would do is it would take 20, it would go into the function clamp, and it would give us back the largest number it can within that range, which is 10. So by putting in 20, we'd get back 10. And this is what we want to do in Unity. We want to find where our player is in our world. We want to put it into our range, which is going to be the ranges we just calculated for our acid pool, and then find where in that range we can place it. If it's outside of our range, then just place it at the max or the minimum of that range. So first in the function, we give it the value we want to monitor. So we're gonna do this twice, both for where the player is on the X axis and where they are on the Y. So we write player, which again, we worked out earlier by finding by using find object of type player. Player dot position, which is gonna access, let me find the player again, which is gonna access the transform components position coordinates and then we write position.x, which acts, accesses specifically it on the x axis. Then we need to feed it our range. So we feed it the minimum value for x, which we calculated earlier, is this line here. And the maximum value for x, which we calculated earlier, was this line here. And then the function clamp is going to give us a number and store it inside x position. So it's going to give us a value on the x axis that's anywhere between this range here. That value is then gonna be as close as it can to the position of where the player is on the x-axis. Then we simply do the same for y. We find out where the player is on the y-axis. We give our mathf.clamp function the minimum value of y and the maximum value of y that we want to set our values range. If the player is within that range, then brilliant, we'll just get the number that the player is at on the y-axis, but if it exceeds or is lower than that range, then we'll just get our min and max value. So now that we have numbers inside x pos and y pos, we can put them into our audio point variable. So to create a new vector free, which is basically a coordinate, we say new vector free, then we give it the values we want to store in that coordinate. So for the x position, we want to give it our x pos variable, for y, we give it the y pos, and then for the z, we're going to just say, take the position of this object on the z axis and just use that. The reason why, if I click out 2D mode, the reason why is because all of our objects, including the player, are on uh, zero on the z axis. So it doesn't really matter, we don't need to work that one out. And now audio point will give us a point uh, in somewhere in this space of our acid pool, and it's gonna do that for every other acid pool in our game world. Now this if statement here, this is optional, but basically I noticed if the player, let me quickly go back into Unity, if the player was ever under any acid, the acid would sound too loud and too clear. And really you'd want to kind of create an effect of muffledness, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Let's say the player was standing here, we wouldn't want to hear the acid pool too loudly and too clearly because there's all this brick in the way. So what I did is I created that uh, parameter, which I talked about earlier, acid above, and I basically said if the, you know, I set a range between zero and 10. When it's at zero, we're gonna hear the audio at, you know, full frequencies, all the frequencies, 22 kilohertz, and the volume at normal, zero dB. But if it goes anywhere between zero and 10, we're gonna start to lower the, the uh, we're gonna start to remove high end frequencies, we're also gonna lower the volume to a maximum of 100, sorry, 800 hertz, and minus 14 decibels. So what we do is we check to see if the player is ever below the actual acid pool itself. So we say if if the player's position on the y axis is less than the minimum value of our y position, which we calculated earlier, is this line here, then we want to take our acid loop audio and set the parameter acid above to a value based on the player's position. To calculate that value, we're going to take the y position minimum variable, which again is whatever this line is at on the y axis, take the player's position on the y axis, which we know is lower than that line, and we're gonna minus those two values together, which is gonna give us the distance between the two. So the further away the player gets from that minimum value, the more muffled and the quieter it's gonna sound. Finally, we have two more uh, functions to look at. We're gonna first look at the onDrawGizmos function. This is a nice simple one. All this does is it basically draws that little gray dot that you saw earlier that represented where our audio was coming from. So this helps us visually determine whether or not our script is working. So inside the onDrawGizmos function, we write gizmos.drawSphere, then we give it this position we want to draw it at, which was audio point, 
and then we give it a size or a radius. We don't want it too big. So I set the radius of mine to 0 0.25. Finally, the onDestroy function is gonna trigger when this object is destroyed. The object's gonna destroy both acid pools in this level, we're gonna destroy that is, when the scene ends and the player completes the level and moves on to another one. So when that happens, we don't want to hear these acid uh, sounds anymore. So we tell the acid loop uh, audio to stop and I've decided to tell mine to, to just stop immediately. I don't want it to fade out. So I wrote fmod.studio dot stop underscore mode dot immediate inside its parameter brackets and with that we're all done hope i was trying to rush through that a bit because i knew this would be a bit of a long one but hopefully i condensed that enough and it still was clear to you guys so thanks very much for watching i hope that made sense and if it didn't please feel free to let me know in the comments please drop a you know just ask a question we could even email me if you'd rather not comment uh, just get in touch and I'll happily try and explain this a little bit better to you. Also, don't forget about the F Modern Unity Essentials course. Again, if you're interested in signing up to that, we'll have a link in the description or in the top right corner. We even have a Discord now so you can talk to everyone else who's signed up to it and get a little bit more help from myself and them too. So thanks very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, let me know if there's anything else you want to see from this channel. And as always, I've been Henry Scott. Thank you very much for watching.